Good evening. It's a great, great delight for me to be here at Cornell University. I was here most recently about 11 years ago, so it's been quite a while. Um, I find great delight as a, uh, as a student of early modern English history to know something about the illustrious faculty members we have taught here in that area and the history department. And I've learned something about the university's history last night as well, about A.D. White and things like that. The first thought that comes to my mind when I think of Cornell University has been, for better or for worse, the School of Hotel Management. I forgot what it's exactly called, but uh, you have a beautiful campus, a very vibrant student body, and a really, an overall, an excellent university. Um, so thank you for the invitation to be here with you this weekend. So I'm hoping to learn a lot by interacting with you and also in these talks and conversations to think more critically about the Christian deity, especially if and as Christians have said that God exists eternally as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean for us to worship that God? And what does that mean for us to think about and follow that God into all walks of life here in Ithaca, New York, or much, much beyond uh, into uttermost parts of the world. Before we get to that part, um, I just want to make this kind of comment, which is, as is the case with many of our own scholarly and intellectual, spiritual and ministerial endeavors, we don't labor alone and hopefully not in vain. So this talk and the one for tomorrow have been researched and in part produced by two of my students at Vanderbilt, who have volunteered to help me out. So kudos and deep gratitude to Danny and Rachel, and thank you. So I want to talk, so tonight's conversation, because I hope we can have some Q&A time, is entitled Divine Trinity and Human Trafficking. At first blush, they seem to have nothing to do with each other. That seems very odd juxtaposition to talk about Trinity and trafficking. But I do uh, hope to convince you by the end of our evening that if you believe, and some of you may not believe it, and that's perfectly fine, but at least starting to think about the existence of God and the existence of humanity and how the two existences cohere or collide. And so Trinity and trafficking seem to be at a collision course. If God is from eternity past happily existing as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, how and why do we have this problem called human trafficking? Whether you're speaking with a Christian or Muslim or secularist or religious person, the vast majority of the world's population, the vast, vast majority of the world's population would agree that human trafficking or that sort of modern contemporary slavery is not something that is actually good for us. So as I was introduced as someone who does this sort of work, as a, someone who's trained in 17th century English history, how on earth did I come to this kind of work? So I was trained in learning things about 17th century England, but as I began teaching in and learning from people from all different parts of the world, be it Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Vietnam, China, Japan, Korea, India, Poland, France, and Switzerland, um, about the issues of Christian engagement with various manifestations of this breakup or rupture of shalom, the peace of God. So I would go to teach about Christian theology, about Trinitarian theology or Christology, but invariably in these countries, some of the NGO workers and others would want to talk to me about the issues of human trafficking. You see what I mean? So then my interest started to grow. Okay, I, I'm here to talk about theology, but then there is also the lived dimension of this religion or this human existence. So whether in Kenya or Sri Lanka, these problems seem to exist. So it kind of began to grab my interest a little bit more. And then I guess some of you who are academics might realize that after tenure, you get a, a considerable bit more of freedom to pursue your own questions. So after tenure, I said, I want to actually start working on some of these issues, the contemporary issues of human trafficking, and how to think about this theologically. So let me try to kind of concretize it this way. So around 2004, um, I went to teach in Sri Lanka. And it was a great experience of learning about what God is doing. This is shortly after the tsunami. And it was uh, to work with some of the pastors in a theological college. 
And after about a 10 days of engagement, you know, teaching and learning from these Sri Lankan pastors and other theologians, we were um, encouraged to go and, and spend one night in a nice hotel. I'm not going to tell the name of the hotel, but uh, we checked into this very nice hotel, and then a call came from the front desk, or I suppose it might have been the concierge. The gentleman wanted to know if everything was okay in my room or with me. I said, everything seems to be fine. And I was really tired, so I wanted to get some sleep. And he goes, would you like a beer? I said, no, I'm fine. I don't need a beer. Not right now. Uh, would you like some whiskey? I said, I don't need a whiskey. Uh, would you like some wine? I said, I don't need any wine. And then, uh, after a moment's hesitation, this person asked me if I would need a woman. I said, no, I don't need a woman. And then, after a couple of seconds, he asked, would you like a young girl? I said, I do not need a young girl. And then, after a few seconds of hesitation, he asked me, would you like a boy? I said, I do not want a boy. He asked me, would you like two boys? I said, I do not need two boys. And after this several rounds of this Q&A, I said, sir, I'm actually quite tired. I'd like to go to sleep now, so if you don't have any further questions, I'm going to hang up. So I hung up the phone, and I was literally shivering. I realized that what has just happened was at a very respectable hotel in Colombo, Sri Lanka, a concierge was asking me to be engaged in this part of human trafficking network. You don't think of it that way, but that's in, in fact what was happening. So I was thinking, what do I do? So out of, partly out of rage, part of, partly out of desire to tell the Christian truth to this gentleman, I went downstairs. I went downstairs and found a man who actually had phoned me up. And I said, are you the one who had called me in my room at whatever, I think it might have been 605 or something like that. And he goes, yes, have you changed your mind? I said, I've not changed my mind at all. I'm actually here to tell you about why I came to your country. And he goes, why did you come to Sri Lanka? I said, I've come to teach about the love of God. I've come to teach theology. I've come to also learn about how God works in your country. And I will never forget that straight-faced answer from this gentleman. He said, people, with, people who look like you and people with U.S. passports what else do you think they will do here when they come? Are you with me? I said, sex tourism is quite uh, popular, and people with U.S. passports and people who look like you usually come here looking for that thing. And he goes, I simply assume that you are after the same thing. So what is the issue that we're talking about? Uh, this is you know, something that we're all pretty familiar with, I think. Human trafficking is the process or the present state of physical human enslavement. When we think of slavery, we think of something in the ages past, don't we? Whether in the Greco-Roman context or transatlantic slavery, we think of the Civil War here, we think of people like William Wilberforce in uh, the Great Britain and things of that sort. But human trafficking is ever-present reality. I would dare say that it's probably happening in Ithaca, New York. It is certainly happening in Nashville, Tennessee, where I'm from. It is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, or harboring of persons by force, abuse, or exploitation. It is, in fact, modern-day slavery. It is, according to the Department of State in 2003 data, one of the greatest human rights challenges of our time then how are we going to proceed in this evening's talk? We're going to look at some of the sociological and anthropological issues and analysis. We're going to look at some of the numbers. We're going to think about how starkly contrastive that human trafficking is to the shalom that God has designed and desired. But also we will take a second part and second step toward doing this religious or theological analysis. What has the Trinity to do with this, if at all? What does God, does God care? Does God hear? 
Does God act? If so, how does God act? Every other year, I teach a graduate seminar at Vanderbilt called Theodicy and the Problem of Evil in Christian Traditions. And that is, in a nutshell, something like this. If God is all-powerful, and if God is all-loving, why does evil exist? That's been a perennial human predicament. If, according to classical theism, if God is omnibenevolent and omnipotent, all-loving and all-powerful, why do we have to have this thing called evil? Where does it come from? And more importantly, how is God involved in the process of tackling it, dismantling it, and exterminating it, and expunging it from our horizon altogether? By the numbers, 27 million modern slaves is a generally accepted figure across sources. I guess one of the challenges quantifying this issue, statistics, stats can be sometimes unreliable, inconsistent, and unaccepted because there are all of these kind of complications. But nonetheless, I think it's 27 million seems to be a pretty good number. 12.3 million at any one time in the world enforced bond labor, child labor, sex servitude, according to the UN ILO, International Labor Organization. 56% of 12.3 million are women and girls. 10,000 are slaved in U.S. at any one moment, according to Freedom Slaves and Human Rights Center. 1.2 million children are forced into prostitution every year. That is two children per minute. There is a song that some of you may be familiar with. It goes like, there is none like you. Uh, no one can touch me, no one can touch my heart like the way you do. And then part of the chorus line goes something like this. Suffering children are safe in your arms, for there is none like you. I like to raise that question. I like to put that song into an interrogative. Are suffering children really safe in God's arms? And I think it will really force all of us to reckon with that fact, I hope. Staggering number that two children per minute are forced into prostitution every year. That means before our conversation is over by 9 o'clock, that means about 120 children will have been forced into prostitution. 600,000 to 800,000 people trafficked across international borders every year. That's nearly a million persons every year. Continuing on with some of these staggering statistics, second largest source of illegal uh, income worldwide behind drug trafficking is human trafficking. And as opposed to drug trafficking, where you can really see that object, you know, whether it is cocaine or heroin or marijuana, whatever it is, human trafficking is much easier to transport and much cleaner to hide. 40 $4.3 billion in profit from all forced labor, sex, or economic exploitation. And of this, think about this, $30.16 billion in profit from traffic victims, including that sort of economic and sexual exploitation. And guess what? Just when we thought that sex trafficking is an issue that has global and only international implications and issues. Largest profits made in this kind of countries is U.S. with $18.8 .8 billion among the industrialized nations. Now let's try to put these individuals according to price tags. Shall we do that? Morbid and macabre that it is. Average cost is $100 for sexual service in industrialized countries such as America or Britain, France, and so on. Average cost is $15 to $16 for sexual services in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Right? So price differential is quite significant. Thus, that partly explains the growth of tourism of that sort. Clients estimated that each prostitute 
sex worker has 80 clients roughly per month. That's about three to four customers per day. So these are some really, really significant numbers. What we're going to do is to speak of a tale of two cities. Charles Dickens, some of you may remember, has this book novel called A Tale of Two Cities. Prior to Charles Dickens, there was Augustine of Hippo who wrote this book called The City of God, in which he says there is a city of humanity and there is a city of God. These two cities have two origins. These two cities have two different destinations, and they're at war against each other, although which side is winning and which side is losing, especially until the, the consummation of history, it will seem as though that the city of humanity is winning at times. As many of you are Christians, it will seem as though, as we look at this staggering statistic, it seems as though the city of humanity is certainly winning out against the city of God. So just a couple of examples. Wahini and Sunni in India, 90-year-old Wahini and 70-year-old brothers, Sunni lived in the Thane train station in poverty-stricken Mumbai, with two parents who were both alcoholics. Children spent most days at a daycare center where they learned to read and write. And they went there for about three months, and Wahini and Sunni went missing. When the daycare staff set out on a search team for them, the children's father, the children's father revealed how he had sold Wahini and Sunni to a man who came by their home for the equivalent of $30. $30 for two children, nine and seven-year-old. This story hits home for me because I have a nine-year-old son. And I thought about that. Imagine something like that happening to your child, to my child. Would I voluntarily, for whatever the circumstance, do that dastardly act of selling your child, your own child, into this forced labor or slavery or sexual servitude? I want to skip the example of Sophie and talk about Neth from Cambodia. Some of you may know this uh, New York Times columnist, Nick Kristoff, and his wife Cheryl Wudun. They have written this book called Half the Sky. So I live with first-year students at Vanderbilt, and each year, the incoming first-year class, freshman class, gets a commons reading. So last year's commons reading was the book by Christoph and Wudon called Half the Sky, which was about women and the obstacles for women turning them into opportunities for women globally and worldwide. It's a powerful book. If you haven't read it, I would highly encourage you to pick up and read it. Um, it in it, it talks about this whole um, big campaign that Nick Kristoff personally kind of wages to rescue these uh, kind of Cambodian uh, teenagers. So he purchases a Cambodian prostitute with a $150 cash payment in exchange for handwritten receipt. Neth was around 14 or 15 years and had been in a brothel for only about a month when she was brought by a pimp to Christoph's bedroom and says, would you like her service? And Christoph, rather than buying her uh, for her sexual service, uh, buys her for her freedom. Okay. And then it kind of raises that whole question of, you know, she was, when the pimp found out that she had been a virgin, that then she, her price went up and then she was sold into a greater kind of servitude, even to a more pernicious degree. And then he also does it for another uh, girl uh, named Mom, who was trapped in a situation similar to Neth. And Christoph again negotiated with Mom's brothel owner, and the two settled on a selling price of $203. So for the price of $353, he bought these two young women's, young teenagers, freedom. So these are kind of the stories that are there. And then, you know, what is it about this thing? Christoph talks about the fact that rescuing these young girls can be very, very complicated and surely uncertain. But at the same time, never give up. Never give up because successes are possible and those victories are incredibly important even though the road may be fraught with danger and setbacks. And finally, he writes, even when a social problem is so vast as to be insoluble in its entirety, it is still worth mitigating. When you think about these issues of global human trafficking, 
it seems like it's an impossible task. And I want to really encourage and empower you to think big. I had this uh, theodicy seminar that I taught last semester, and uh, in this seminar I had invited this uh, couple, Lacey and Daniel Toller. Uh, they are the founders of this uh, anti-human trafficking ministry or organization called Rescue One Global. They're headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, but they do their work in the Philippines and Thailand and India. And they really came and talked about, you know, what it means for them to follow the promptings of the triune God into the uttermost parts of the world and rescuing and restoring into full dignity and humanity these young girls and boys and women and men who had been sold into servitude. And so after that, I was really kind of struck. And it was a seminar with only about 17 students. So I thought to myself, you know, we can do something more than that. We already have an international justice mission chapter at Vanderbilt. So just this week, actually, earlier this week, I met with some of the student leaders and Lacey and Daniel Toller to do something commons-wide, which is all freshmen, all first-year students are invited to come and listen to and think of ways of getting involved in this. And for them, it is the love of the triune God that motivates and empowers them. We'll think about some of the theological issues in just a moment, but before we do, at least as an early modernist, I thought I should at least talk about someone from my own century, the 17th century, John Donne. Some of you who have English lit courses and so on might be familiar. No man is an island, right? I mean, that kind of clause, you might be familiar, no man is an island. Well, let's read it, read on, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as, as, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in humanity, mankind, and therefore never sent to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. What does that mean? The greater loss to humanity and of those kind of futile death, many of these sex workers and sex slaves die of AIDS, die of drug complication, die of many things that we would never imagine happening to us or to our sisters or to our daughters or to our sons. It is a call for the Christian, all of you, some of you, many of you sitting here as a tolling bell. Because the person who ignores slavery is the one who self-justifies that phenomenon by viewing victims as willing participants in that story. So it really implicates us. No man is an island. You're all kind of woven together. You may not recognize it. You may not be willing to recognize it. But according to this, when the bell tolls, it is tolling for you. There have been some symphonic social movements, starting with the abolitionist movement back in the day, in the 19th century, with William Wilberforce and others working indefatigably to abolish this. There have been political reasons for doing so. There are some sociological and certainly religious reasons for doing so, that they were really involved in extirpating from their country in Great Britain this thing called transatlantic slavery. It certainly happened here in the pursuit of social purity in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, many began to follow that sort of middle-class evangelical Christian reformers who wanted to cleanse society of vice, and that movement sort of promulgated public sympathy for female victims of moral repressiveness. And the fight for religious freedom in the late 20th century, just our last century, also shows that how that has been sort of a social movement that has been symphonic kind of momentum that has brought us to where we are today. And we'll look at some of the contemporary context. What are we kind of facing in our times and day? The whole issue of globalization, right? You can Skype with somebody in Pakistan. You can talk to somebody on the phone, you know, someone in Uganda or Tanzania or Spain. The world is shrinking. That means it is much more accessible for you to do good things as well as some terrifying things. Technology has made it possible for you to do some powerfully terrific things as well as perniciously terrifying things. The technology itself is neutrally predisposed. What you do with it is according to your own moral dictates and your conscience. 
Globalization has brought in these many possibilities and perils. Religious revivals also has brought to the fore this whole resurgence of thinking about human rights. Re religious, because many in the 1960s said God is dead and religion will become more and more irrelevant and side, kind of sidelined and completely marginalized, if not expunged from human horizon. Such is manifestly not the case. There's been there's genuine revival of global religion, as I've heard from Carl Johnson that you're having Philip Jenkins to come to talk about the next Christendom and the sort of the ongoing persistence of religion in the global discourse and our public spheres. But also, not only with globalization, not only with the survival and thrival of religion, but also there's this kind of issue of poverty, the absence of shalom in all of its meanings. Surely we can say that the poor have a lot more things that we don't have. They may even seem happier, but poverty as a global pandemic is causing not only the developed nations, but also the developing nations to think critically about what it means to share our resources together. What does it mean to be, to be more equitable and equal, equality pursuing global village together? So these are some of the, the issues that we are finding ourselves. Let's move a little bit more quickly then kind of have a few more slides to go through. What about the Trinity? So if so far we have looked at the sociological and the anthropological perspectives, the data out there that are staggering, the things that are there within our own human hearts, within our own heart right here and now, as well as without, the impulse that are there, the macabre impulse and the dark desires that are there, how do we control it? How do we contain it? And how do we keep ourselves from falling into that particular trap of being a participant in that human trafficking enterprise of our world? It seems that God from eternity past has this powerful desire for showing us how to be and how to behave. The Trinity, according to the classical Christian doctrine, means something like this. That God is an eternal, happy or felicitous relationship among the Father, Son, and and the Holy Spirit. Let me try to break it down so that we kind of get it together. It's the next one. A person in the Trinity is a relation. And I want you to think about this, because this is quite crucial. How do we think about how is it that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are not three gods, but one God? How is it that they overlap and interpenetrate? How is it they have what theologians call perichoretic kind of mutual indwelling? That there are three persons in perfect harmony. Their desire and their actions are always lifting the other. The Father is blessed and Father blesses the Son and lifts up the Son. The Son's mission is to lift up the Father and listen to the Father. And the Spirit's mission, Spirit's work is not do anything according to His own desire, but to do the will, to do the will of the One who sent Him. So that means something like this. The Trinity is always is a relation. A person in the Trinity is a relation. That means in God, what exists is that happy and perfect and unbreakable relationship. Right? Now think about the word relationship, friends. Think about the word relationship. And would you use the word broken relationship or happy relationship to speak of your relationship so far? Okay? Think about that. Just, I'll give you a, a five seconds, seven seconds to think about, think about the word relationship and apply that to your life. Maybe you can say non-existent relationship. Maybe that, that may be the case. But maybe we are familiar with and acquainted with broken relationships. It could be romantic relationship that went sour, south. Maybe it could be the friendships that you have formed and fostered while at Cornell, but, or while in Ithaca, and they went broken and ruptured, okay? But the point that I want us to think about is that within God, within the triune God, a person is a relation. Then that leads me to a very, very crucial corollary, three-part corollary. If, if what we mean by this, the Trinity, a person in the Trinity is a relation, if that is true, if God exists as a composite of eternal and unbreakable relation or relationship, if that is true, then all of life is about relations. Think about this, friends. No man, no woman is an island. And extrapolate that further, that means something like this. 
that you are born from the moment you're born even if you're separated from your birth mother you had a relationship you have a relationship you're not some kind of automaton and self generative existence you didn't come to this world of your own somebody had to carry you for a few months and then mother uh, with the help of the father who may or may not have been there with the help of sperm don't whatever it is with that help of some the two entities coming together you have come into this world that means from the get-go you are in that relational modality are you with me so far so we are all kind of in this sort of relationship if this is true then life is all about relations from the beginning till the end even though in our expiring moments we die alone yes we do but even in that dying moments I bet many of us think about relationships the relationship that we're gonna leave behind the relationship that we're gonna be looking forward to some of us would do that but all of us bar none I think will think about the relationships that we're leaving behind sometimes deeply longing for them how I wish that I had more of it other times really kind of lamenting the fact that you didn't do a better job in them but if God is relations then all of life is about relations and secondarily if this is true then God's work of salvation is restoring the beauty and the dignity of relations now try to think about it this way because maybe you don't think of this whole thing of salvation in this fashion maybe many of us are accustomed to thinking that salvation is about forgiveness of sins that God's job is to forgive as Shakespeare said to err is human and to forgive divine so God's job is to forgive and salvation is seen as a transactional entity I have committed sins God's forgiving me there was much more than that salvation according to Christianity is not merely about transactional thing it is also about transformational thing that God is in the business of restoring relationships God is in the business of restoring these broken and ruptured relations and God's work of salvation the work that God the Father Son and the Holy Spirit does and God is from eternity past and even now is in that happy relationship then the work of God of salvation is restoration of the beauty and dignity of relations let's move to the third part right here if this is true then in light of this divine Trinity human trafficking needs to be seen as a rupture a relation now let, let me put it concretely when you look at another person how do you see that person do you see that person as an object of conquest it could happen at a Cornell campus when you look at another person do you see them as you know someone that I want to violate someone I you know the whole thing we are doing a lot of campaign about sexual violence at Vanderbilt right and I'm sure you're doing something similar it seems like campus sexual violence is a pandemic that seems uncontrollable and I think it stems from this listen very carefully when you look at another person you're looking at them as an object of conquest I must conquer her I must conquer him but the Christian theology if we really understand the being of God as in relations it's a relations that is otherwise seeking it is lifting the other that means as you understand God more as you draw nearer to God as you fall in love with God more and more one thing you will have to come to change is to stop looking at other people as objects of conquest but as objects of love and service so if this is true human trafficking needs to be seen as a rupture of relation thus Christians ought to be involved in this not because it's going to be trendy right just following or but because God's heart is here aching and calling those who would go so let's think about this for a little bit what does that mean if God if life is about if if God is about relations if all of life is about relations then this whole thing of sexual exploitation is a rupture of relations relationship and think about your best relationship it could be your with your BFF could be with your parents it could be with your siblings it could be with with your whatever think of the most beautiful and sublime relationship that you have 
Of course, we end up hurting each other sometimes, but in our best and most human moments in the Imago Dei, in the image of God, what we seek to do in those relationships is not to exploit them, but use my talent and time and treasure to serve them, you see? And that's what the, tr the triune God is in the business of doing and being. So God's heart is, so if that is true, then this rupture needs to be repaired. And we see a beautiful example of this here. We now come to the tale of the second city, the city of God. Now the passage I have up here on the screen is a passage from John chapter 8. I think many of us are familiar with this passage, aren't we? Let me read it for us. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they began asking, you know, the law, right? According to the law of Moses, such individuals ought to be stoned to death. What do you say? And you know that they asked this question of Jesus in order to trap him in his answer. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said, Powerful and poignant answer, isn't it? Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard walked away until Jesus was left with the woman. And it says actually starting with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And Jesus is now with the woman and the stage is set for that powerful question that Jesus asks. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she says. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declares. Go and leave your life of sin. What just happened here? It's a powerful story, isn't it? The woman, and you know, I've always, I've spoken on this passage several times before, and I always wondered about this. Now you know what I wonder about? Yes. What did he write? Okay, that I have wondered about too, but there's another question, much more important question than that. What is it? Where is the man? Where is the man? Now, it's not a trivial question. I think it's quite significant. It seems to me that this woman was set up. The man had taken off. And t try to put yourself in that situation, right? The man, we don't know where the man is. Maybe he's one of the onlookers right there. Maybe he'd been bought, he'd been paid for by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who wanted to accuse Jesus of his inability to interpret the Torah rightly because he was between a rock and a hard place, wasn't he? Because if he says, go and stone her, what law would he be breaking? The Roman law. But if he says, do not stone her, then he will be seen as being soft on the law of God. So it is between the skilla of legalism and the charybdis of just kind of willy-nilly, you know, kind of denial of the normativity of both the Torah and the Roman law that Jesus is going to be found a liar and a, basically not a great teacher. So I've always wondered about where is the man, and here's why. When I look at this passage, what comes to mind is as follows. You see, to me, this story really shows a sublimely beautiful passage of a person who was used and duped by the system and brought to the divine judge on faith to be accused. No man to be found. Surely she was complicit and she was active in that act of adultery. Let's not diminish that. But at the same time, she seems to be a victim of the system of entrapment. And Jesus says to her, now think of that moment. Let's say you are that individual accused, fully knowing that even though unfairly so, even though you don't know what just happened, but you are feeling the power and the venom of the law. What it will do is it's going to kill you. And you're brought before this man that you think you know, but you're not really sure. They are addressing him as a teacher, so you think that he must be a quite an effective or very, very well-known popular teacher. And they're asking him, what should we do, what should we do? This guy just keeps on writing. You have no clue. But it asks this question that is so penetrating, so powerful, so explosive, that one by one everyone leaves 
therefore leaving the stage for this fateful confrontation between this teacher and this woman. And he asked this question, where are your accusers? She's dumbfounded. If I had been Jesus, I would be mad at her. Why would you get me so much trouble? What were you doing anyway? Bring them. He says no such thing. What he says is, where are your accusers? She says, they have left. And then he says something that is truly earth-shattering. And I think that's partly the reason why that particular pericope, that particular passage is often bracketed off as not being found on the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament. Because if you actually think wrongly and misinterpret that particular passage, Jesus is going to be seen as being soft on sin, right? Because think about that. He says what? I don't condemn you and leave now. Leave your life of sin. He makes it quite emphatic in my humble opinion that she can leave because she's not condemned and you, you should leave your life of sin. But here's something that I think is kind of sometimes missing in our interpretations. See, the last point is this. Jesus is not soft on law at all. But he will be in the very act of fulfilling the law, be crushed, be crucified, be executed by the law. Are you with me? See, here's the beauty. Why would Jesus, how could Jesus have the audacity and the authority to say that I do not condemn you? Here is why, my friends. Because he himself will be condemned for her. Think about that. Let that sink into your hearts. The only reason why he could say that I don't condemn you is because he is going to be condemned for her. Someone was trapped in that system. Someone who was now ready to hear the words of execution. He basically says, stay the hand. I will not execute you. I will not condemn you because I will die in your place. Thus the guilt of your sin, the price of your wrongdoing, all the shame, all the sorrows, all the tears, all the pent up anger and animosity and anxiety you have, I'm going to take that right to the cross because I will be executed on your behalf. I'm teaching a course in a Riverbend Maximum Security Prison in Nashville, Tennessee. A course called Prison Writings and Spirituality of Freedom. And as I teach that class, I learn something really every time from the insiders, those who have been there. And I bring there about 14 or so Vanderbilt students and then about 15 or so of the insiders. And we're learning about this whole thing. And in our first week, we talked about this. I said, you know, many in the Christian tradition, rightly and justifiably and understandably, sanitize the death of Christ. We call it the death of Christ. We call it the crucifixion of Christ. But you know what? It is in fact the execution of Christ. Jesus was executed. Do you realize that? He was executed according to the Roman law. He died a death on a cross. Now, it really is mind-blowing for me. I wasn't nurtured in a Christian context. I grew up in a home that was you know, non-religious. So I didn't become a Christian until I was a junior in college. And you know what was the hardest thing, the most incredible and unbelievable thing about Christianity for me? Was if God exists, why would this God come down to where we are and die a death that is reserved for the worst of criminals? What is that message? I could not fathom it. And even as I think about it now, as I've been on this journey for the last quarter century, it still sends chills down my spine. Why would you do that, God? Why would you be condemned for this woman who was caught in the act of adultery? Why would you die for so many in this world who may not even utter your name in a positive way at all? What would you do? He was condemned for me as one of my Students, insiders said, as we were reading the, the incarceration narrative of Jeremiah, one of them said, you know what, Jeremiah did not deserve to be incarcerated. I deserve to be. And then another person chimed in and said, you know what, Jesus did not deserve to be incarcerated and executed. I deserve to be. 
You know, I learned something so powerful and transformative in that maximum security prison. I learned that coming to recognize that, you know, God is involved in this. That Jesus is doing time for all of us. As the story from a maximum security prison in Mexico illustrates that Jesus is doing time for all of us. Therefore, the darkest of dungeons and the valley of the shadow of death is not invincible because Jesus, the one who was condemned for me, is walking with me. Now, I realize something that is occurring here in my mind, and perhaps in your minds as well. It still doesn't make the first part and the second part stick together in a kind of glued fashion. It seems as though I have just shared this whole thing and said, well, there's this staggering data about global human trafficking that happens perhaps here in Ithaca, New York, as well as in Nashville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, New York City, Seattle, Washington, Chicago, Illinois, or small villages and big metropolises. This is happening in America, in Cambodia, Korea, France, Britain, Finland, you name it, Africa, South America, it is there. So on the one hand, I talked about that, and on the other hand, I talked about John chapter 8, and the story of Jesus speaking the truth of pardon to this woman, but how do they coer together? See, I can completely understand why for some of my secular atheist friends, the preponderance of human trafficking and, and, and other victims of violence is proof positive for the non-existence of God. They will say, you know what? Because these things happen, I cannot and will not believe in the existence of God. Story of the Grand Inquisitor and Brothers Karamazov, where Ivan Karamazov says, you know, if there is one single innocent child victimized by other predators, and if God allows it to happen, then I'm going to give the ticket back to God and stop believing in God. Powerful theodicy challenge. But, if God does not exist as Ivan wishes him away, according to Fyodor Dostoevsky, the author of Brothers K, Brothers Karamazov, says all things are possible that we can do anything and there is no kind of ethical kind of restraint that will be placed. But the final point is this, but precisely because God exists in your belief system, and so I'm speaking primarily in this instance to the Christian sisters and brothers here, precisely because God exists, and precisely because in Jewish and Christian scriptures, God is portrayed as the perfect embodiment of justice and mercy, then we can and ought to fight for justice and mercy while extending the, our hands of mercy to them, believing that we will learn all the more about self-society and Savior in this process. I don't know about you, but I'm sure at Cornell there are you know, various kind of uh, non-profit organizations or student groups that are designed to fight this or alleviate the suffering of those around us in our world. Let me close with this. This is him that says, This is my father's world, oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems often strong, God is a ruler yet. It takes the eye, it requires the eyes of faith. It seems that the wrong seems so strong, God is still on the throne. This is my father's world, why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king and let the heavens sing. God reigns and let the earth be glad. So I think there is a struggle for all of us. There's a struggle for all of us, desire for shalom, desire for restoration, desire for beauty, desire for goodness, desire for truth. And we live caught between the two worlds, don't we? We live caught between the two worlds, right in our heart and soul. There's a desire for involving ourselves in that helping operation, but also for many of us, there's a desire for participating in that negative way and dastardly way. We find ourselves caught in a moral dilemma. And each and every day, we find ourselves crying out to the Lord, Lord, help me, I believe, help my unbelief. So my dear sisters and brothers, as we are thinking about this, if God exists as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit from eternity past, already happy, always existing, always full of joy, then our desire is correspondingly to follow this triune God and follow this God wherever God's heart aches, to go and see those individuals as our sisters and brothers, those who are created in the image of God, 
no longer as an object of conquest, but as an object, as individuals who need our helping hand. And in, in helping so, we save our souls. And we learn so much from who we are. And they, in fact, help us in restoring our own dignity, our own beauty, and our own mercy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you know, we talk a lot here uh, at Chesterton House and in other campus fellowships about the integration of faith and learning. And this was just a wonderful example and illustration of uh, a talk that's uh, both deeply rooted in serious um, scholarship as well as uh, a serious consideration of the Christian faith. So we very much appreciate um, what you're modeling this evening. Uh, we have some time for Q&A. And as you take a moment to think and formulate uh, your questions, um, and as we give our speaker a break to uh, get a drink of water. Um, let me just remind you of a couple of brief announcements. There's the bake sale out back. We hope you will stop out on your way out. Uh, tomorrow morning, our guest will speak twice at Bethel Grove Bible Church. You've got the schedule in your hand here, but there's registration at 8.30, and then beginning at 9 o'clock, he will give uh, two talks um, on the topic of the Trinity, Ethics, and Ecology. And then Sunday morning, again at Bethel Grove, uh, he will be preaching the sermon on Trinitarian spirituality. And we hope you'll join us uh, for what parts of the weekend you can. And again, uh, tomorrow evening, Saturday evening, Christine Kwok will give the uh, violin concert in Sage Chapel at 7.30. That's free and open to the public. Hope you'll come and uh, bring some friends. We have two students who are going to carry the microphones up and down the aisles. Uh, so if you have a question, please just signal to them. They'll get the microphone over to you, and that will uh, help us out so everybody can hear your question well. Anyone? Okay. Toby, there's one back there. Thank you. What is the UNESCO doing? I'm sorry? The UNESCO. What is the UNESCO doing? United Nations Economic, Social, Economic Organization. What is UNESCO doing? All right, well, I mean, there's all different kinds of organizations such as UNESCO and UNICEF and so on that are designed to tackle this and designed to tackle it at a local level and a global level. So a general answer would be, is this pandemic that every, not only the U.S. government, but U.N. and other organizations recognize a problem that must be addressed head on, not only for short term. It's not just good enough to rescue them, but also reinstatement of these individuals back into society. So teaching them some kind of uh, uh, trace skills and also getting them a lot of counseling help, art therapy, music therapy, and things of that sort are uh, kind of being required, uh, requested to really help them. Because I think a lot of the critique by some folk, because the NPR did a special on some of these kind of anti-human trafficking efforts, particularly by the evangelicals. And it was seen as a lot of evangelicals do a heroic job of rescuing them, right? But they're not as good a job in terms of the following steps that are, if rescuing individuals from this exploitation kind of mode is 10% of the whole picture, the 90% is about getting them back into society and getting them, giving them the sense of dignity and goodness and so on. So it's got to be much more holistic, and UNESCO and UNICEF, uh, UNICEF are doing things of that sort. Much more kind of long process and organic approaches of that problem solving. Thank you. Yeah. I think so, yeah. I was just going to ask, um, what about um, solving this problem in the rural sector? Like, sort of, I mean, I, I understand um, kind of more of a, I don't know what the word is, like getting people out of like, fighting to get people yep. out of slavery from urban centers, but what about strengthening the rural sector so people aren't selling their children into a situation like this? I mean, I, my, my field is agriculture. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. No, I, no that's, a, that's a great point. So this whole thing of global human trafficking is not just an ethical issue as much as an economic issue, right? Because of lack of, and now, it's both that, I think. It's not merely ethical. It's not merely economic. There are core lessons of both these things and more that make this a unique, well, it's a contemporary kind of conglomerate of problems. So I would agree with you that I think, so there's been some efforts to provide much more of a microeconomic kind of microfinancing options available, giving some of these kind of rural folks an opportunity to participate in the economic system. Part of the problem, I think, if I can just speak candidly, is that in some of these countries, there is this kind of real no viable economy that is sustainable and shareable across the, the social sector, that those in the rural villages are certainly so disadvantaged that without much compunction, maybe with some regret, I don't know, parents are willing to give up their kids. If in the earlier generation was adoption, now it is sexual exploitation in a much more morbid fashion. So I totally agree with you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, there's... Can you speak about um, individualism in respect to its, um, its effect on relations and relationships? So, for example, when you were in that hotel, they were asking you something specific to you and your possible need and choice. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe talk about institutions that support or even nurture individualism. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question rightly. So that episode in Sri Lanka underscores that individualism, that... The, con the, concept, the concept of, like they were asking you of yeah. your choice. What yeah, would you yeah. like? What would you prefer? Yeah, 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 yeah. And to me, that's something that's connected to, you know, it, it, it was coming down to what what's for you. Yeah, 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 that's right, and, right. And that's very, uh, uh, that affects our relationship, because if I'm just worried about me. Yeah, no, I I'm think you're right. about my brother. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. So basically, I think what, what this uh, Sri Lankan gentleman was offering to me was a smorgasbord, smorgasbord of choices. And all of these choices have been objectified, right? Now think about it, that's a very good question. A beer is no different from a young girl. A scotch is no different from a young boy. These are all objects to satisfy my individual desire. And what they were was they were on offer for sale. So we objectify people, we commercialize people, we quantify people as sellable goods. And we, we see them that way. And I think that's a real global challenge. And again, if you don't remember much else from this talk, I hope you remember this. Do you look at people as objects of conquest? Do you look at people as objects, of, objects to be objectified, to be enjoyed purely for your own benefit? And I think that's a real chilling reminder for me that I can easily do that. And so, except for the grace of God, go I. I mean, you know, I think it's just... And what he said to me was, I'll never forget. People who, with your passport, people who look like you, when you come to my country, what else do you think they do? Double slap. Thanks. Yes, sir. Back there. Over here. Over here and then back there. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lim. Um, my question is about sexuality, because I think obviously that's a huge part of the underlying issue of sex trafficking. And um, I think we're overwhelmingly bombarded with negative images of sexuality yep. and um, having real conversations about the beauty of, of life and the, beauty, the real meaning of sex yep. uh, are really challenging. Yep. Um, so um, I thank you for you know, all of your stories and, and all the work that you're doing, obviously, around these issues. Mm. Uh, do you have any suggestions about, I don't know, <laughs> fruitful ways 
to tackle this topic among you know university students and beyond. Thanks. About the beauty of human sexuality. Is yes. That right? Yeah, I, I think it's become banalized and commercialized and become so available and at, it comes at students. I mean, I have a nine-year-old son and I'm pretty sure, I don't know, I, I'm, he may actually be watching this on live stream right now back home. <laughs> so I, don't, I might ask him whether he knows. Maybe I don't want to ask him, right? But, um, <laughs> Strike that, my son. You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> you know, I mean, technology allows you to banter back and forth with your son over there when he's thousands of miles away. I think, you know what? So I think it seems to me that technology, again, Marshall McLuhan says, you know, medium is the message itself, too. And I think it's, you know, we create objects. I mean, there is a kind of insatiable desire that we have. I mean, we, we are desiring beings, right? Even though you may not be able to actualize your desire, even, you know, until our dying day, we desire things. Desire, you know, things that are truly beautiful, truly legitimate and illicit. But when it is expressed to other, to illicit avenues and individuals, then it becomes so, it's not the act itself, but the direction it takes that I think is really deeply problematic in some instances. I do think that, you know, so the book of Song of Songs, I know you guys are studying Proverbs, but Song of Songs was regarded by some to be so kind of rated R that how can you, I mean, I don't know about you, but I became a Christian at age 21. This is kind of a funny story. And I read the Song of Songs. Every, I, I would go to church and I really didn't know anything about Christianity. I go to church and bored most of the time when these preachers are talking. And somebody told me I should read the Song of Songs. You like it. <laughs> and I began reading Song of Songs. I said, wait a minute. This is part of the Bible? That became my favorite book of the Bible, you see. <laughs> it is talking about breast this, chest that. I was like, unbelievable stuff. <laughs> and if you feel uncomfortable about what I'm saying, therein lies a problem, right? Within a certain Christian community, it's really kind of awkward to talk about sexuality. Why is that? I mean, so I think for me, a concrete takeaway was that, you know, so, so there is a kind of allegorical, allegorical interpretation to speak of the relationship between the Shunammite woman and the lover is actually the love between the Christ and the church. Because that way, we, our, we, our faces won't be blushing. Because it's really not about breasts, it is about the church and things like that. No, 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 no. I think it's that actually a very kind of romantic, kind of erotic poetry that's there as part of a Jewish kind of wisdom tradition. That in their enjoyment of life, if all of life is relation, if a deep way of expressing your oneness with another individual is through that sexual intercourse that God has designed, I mean, it really amazes me that if, if God is a creator of my being and my body, then in God's intricate and infinite design, God made our sexual mechanisms to be like that. And I'm not at all ashamed to be talking about it in this way. I mean, that's, if God is a creator, and if God's a creator of sex, well, I mean, enjoying it with the person that God is delighted in is perfectly legitimate. In fact, that glorifies God. But I just want to leave that with you. Because I think, you know, in a way, a good that is misdirected, misused, gave the people the impression that good itself is problematic. And I don't think it is. So, thank you. That's a great question. Yes? You sort of modeled your talk on the triune God versus the human condition. Uh, in this case, human trafficking. And you mentioned the fact that you teach two courses. Mm. Uh, theology of evil, I guess, would be in one. Yep. And the other one would be the, the one that you mentioned in the maximum security prison. Yep. Can you go a little bit deeper on that uh, from a theological standpoint? Why do people do what they do? Why do they engage in this uh, from a theological perspective? Yep. Um, the Hebrew scripture is quite revealing in demonstrating for us the extent of the rupture of shalom. 
read Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4. Four chapters of the Bible, right? What happened? 1 and 2 is the story of creation, right? 3 is the story of rupture of shalom. Chapter 4, what do you have? Is a clear instantiation of the extent of human waywardness or paradise lost. What have you there in chapter 4? Do you know what that story is? It's a story of Cain and Abel. Fratricide. It is saying, I'm not my brother's keeper. It to me demonstrates, and, and look, if you don't believe there's historical fact that's fine by me, then I ask that question to you. Why is it there? If it is a myth, okay, fine. What is it doing there? What is the canonical function of that story, the series of stories that are there in 1, 2, 3, and 4? It is to demonstrate two things for me. That the shalom that, that God, God creates, that God saw everything that God has created and it was good. God blessed it, right? So there's a benediction of God. But also there's a malediction of God. It says, you know, on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And then what happens? You know, even to Cain, what really... So this is a theodicy problem for me. Okay? And this may confuse some, pardon me. If it clarifies some issues, then that's great. You know what really bugs the heck out of me? Whenever I read the story of Cain and Abel? What bothers you about this story? Who does God speak to? Who? Cain. You know what? Who should have God spoken to? Abel, because he would have run away. <laughs> he could have prevented that fratricide from happening in the first instance. So right there is a problem for me. You see, my friends, I began, I began my Christian journey at age 21, and I am doing what I'm doing, teaching what I do, partly because I want to entertain and answer some of these questions and still get paid for them. I mean, some of you don't get to answer your questions and, and you don't get paid for them, but I get to kind of present these sophisticated problems and say, you know, let's think about them. And, and the university pays me a good salary and I'm thankful for it. I mean, this is, this is what I do. And you're like, yeah, that's it, right? I mean, really, right? So but that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, why doesn't God do it? See, I have a lot of questions about the Christian faith. But let me share this too. By definition, God is infinite. By Existential data and fact, I know I'm finite, frail, and fragile. That means by definition, I'm not supposed to know God in God's infinity. That means, of course, by definition, I'll have questions. That means it is faith-seeking understanding. I don't know everything, but I know the one who knows. I know the one who knows everything, yet he's come down to where we are, had to learn to speak, had to have his diapers changed had to be nursed, God in God's amazing condescension of humility, in the beauty of incarnation, becomes one of us. I still don't understand why God didn't speak to Abel. There are questions about the Hebrew Scriptures or New Testament that I have to say, I really don't get it. Are there hints of genocidal attempts in the Hebrew Bible? Think you can make a case for that? And does that therefore become causes for some people to walk away from the Christian faith or Judaism? I can see that. There are lots of mysteries about, about the Christian faith. Honestly, for Protestants, we haven't done a lot of good work on mystery because we feel as though we have to be able to figure God out by studying the Bible, inductive Bible studies, and this and that. We will got God figured out. I don't think so. Okay, I think there may be a couple more questions. Yeah, over there. Yeah, um, Dr. Paul, um, thank you very much uh, for the this uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, I want to kind of echo an earlier point comment that was made. Um, um, you, you showed us um, the statistics of now that there are uh, 1.2 million children out there who is who are involved in uh, human trafficking. Yeah. Now that there's a lot of work going on uh, to alleviate that that problem. I'm wondering whether it's stressing a lot of importance in bringing an awareness in the society, because I'm, I come from India and I, and I know of like people in villages and rural areas where parents, um, like guys, uh, speak to their parents and under the pretense of giving them good jobs, they take them to place like 
really far away from home where they have no connection. So it's not right. like going from New York to Pennsylvania, but it's like going from New York to California. Yeah. So the distance is so huge and they're completely disconnected. Yeah. So you also mentioned a few organizations that you work for. So I'm wondering if one of the strategies could be like talking, like bringing an awareness to those parents, like telling them this is not the fact yep. why your kids are taken. Yep. And I was wondering if you have any comments on that. Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, there, there needs to be kind of a, a multi-pronged approach, not only economics, not only ethics, but also education, right? And really kind of providing uh, education both at the parental level as well as, uh, as, as for the school children. I mean, I think there are, you know, um, life doesn't seem equal, right? Doesn't seem fair sometimes. And it causes me, at least, to say, God, can we do something together? I mean, you care about this stuff, don't you, God? And so I think for some of the parents, I mean, you're, you're right. Maybe they, some of them may not know what is happening, and I think that is true. I think a lot of these kind of victims of sexual slavery and exploitation, a lot of them do not willingly go in knowing like, oh, this is what's going to happen to me. I mean, they're duped into and hoodwinked into and deceived into this kind of really terrifying consequences. And you're right. I mean, if parents knew what their children would be subjected into, would they willingly do that? Some, um, hate, um, I regret to inform you, do do it. Many do not. So I think that, you know, whether by the Indian government or the Filipino government or in Kenya, whatever governments there are, local and national level, I think real kind of uh, raising that awareness and really activistic approach to educate its citizenry so that your children really matter to you. Your children matter to our country. We want to really get, I mean, I think it's, it's that it needs to be trickled down from the national level. It can't be just some international NGO saying, thou shalt stop this. It really has to come from within, within the family, within the village, within the state, within the country. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, just another question, kind of going off of that. Yeah. Um, this is like a hypothetical. But so if all humans, whether that's in labor trafficking or sweatshops or sex trafficking, were to be freed, how would you see the global economy changing? And for example, like if sex tourism drives the economy in certain Southeast Asian countries, just as American consumerism drives the need for labor trafficking, how would or could you see this economic problem be resolved in your eyes or opinion? Do you have a question written down? Have you? Read? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, you read it so fast. So, I, I, so you're saying if, in a sort of counterfactual fashion, if all of these workers are freed, mm -hmm. what would that mean in terms of economic impact globally, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is a good answer to this, but I'm just kind of curious of your thoughts. I mean, I think regardless of the economic consequences or price tag, there would be a great scenario. And I think we, are, we ought to remember, I mean, that's a great question in that we need to think about that. It's not a counterfactual, but it's a hopeful reality um, that if that happens, are we prepared to pay the price? I mean, so, for example, the, the, let's try to come up with a couple of analogs that are Somewhat inadequate, but let's give them a try. The Eastern and Western Germany, right? East Germany, West Germany, when they got reunited, there was a serious economic cost to the reunification, right? But the, West, I mean, the, the, the Germans were saying, we're going to do this. We're committed to it, and we're going to make sure that it happens. I was born in South Korea. I'm going to be going to Korea in April, I think, to uh, participate in a consultation on Northeast Asian reconciliation, which is a euphemism for North Korean affairs. <laughs> I've been to Korea multiple times since leaving in 1982 to talk with some of the young, young folks. And I asked them, do you want unification? And some of them said, well, it may cost us a lot of money. Now think about that, right? Exterminating and eradicating global human trafficking will cost us a lot of money, some say, and rightly so. And I don't know, it's seemingly incalculable economic cost, right? But then, are you prepared to do it? 
Are there certain things that are beyond the price tag that you should do it no matter what? Right? And I would say that this is definitely one of them. So I don't have a sort of concrete, quantifiable answer, but generally a qualitative answer. I hope that helps. Probably not. My apologies. Hi. Um, I don't know how much you know about One this. more question I'm told, OK? So over here, and then whoever you two decide to give the microphone to will be the blessed individual. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much you know about this, but in a culture that has normalized like pornography and yeah. sex, what's the connection of human trafficking and pornography? Um, like in our culture, we don't, whatever pornography is watched or whatever, but there is a connection there, right? Yeah. I'm just curious what you're... Well, yeah, so I, I think therein lies the dilemma of uh, 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 our, our um, liberal colleagues. Um, free expression of human, you know, whatever bodily motions and whatever activities. So pornography is not bad, some might opine. And so to link pornography with human trafficking that is prudish, that shows that you're conservative, and this, that, and other. When this thing happened, when my uh, Lacey and Daniel Toller came, and they made a connection between pornography and human trafficking. A uh, couple of students in my seminar said, well, that's because they're conservatives. They're kind of puritanical and saying pornography causes human trafficking and blah, blah, blah. My answer was, OK. That may or may not be the case. But they, these conservative fundamentalists, are doing something about this problem. What are you, smart, wonderful, liberal person, doing about this problem? You know, I'm reminded of D.L. Moody, right? This preacher, uh, revivalist, who, after preaching a sermon, was accosted by a man who said, Sir, in your sermon, you had about 50 grammatical mistakes. And I said, Sir, thank you very much for pointing out the 50 grammatical mistakes. I, with my 50 grammatical mistakes, proclaim the infallible wisdom and the wonder of God? What have you with an impeccable grammar done for God lately? Anyone else? I'm not really sure whether that... My hunch is there is a connection, right? How to really establish... I mean, so according to my friends who are in this line of work, a lot of pornography is produced and manufactured in countries where these, and their individuals who are participating in this, are trafficked individuals who are actually coerced into these sexual acts and are produced and then, you know, watched instantly in different parts of the globe. If that is the case, and I'm, I have reasons to believe that is the case, although I have also reasons to believe that that's probably not the total extent of the mode of production and the rationale of production of pornography, but then at least certain part of it is produ produced under duress, then you can make that causal linkage, I think. And without any political affiliation with the right wing or left wing, I think that's something that... But there are certain people who says pornography is no problem, it is, it is an art form, it should be totally listed and sanctioned. So you got kind of, you're caught between a rock and a hard place when you come to thinking about these issues. The quandary of the radical right and radical left, I think that's patently clear. So. I think somebody has a last word, last question. Everyone is shy about that? Okay. There are a couple of hands. You have to decide which one. The microphone, maybe over here. Okay. Don't let me meddle. Okay, you all okay. figure it out. Just ask me easy <laughs> I, question. I'm tired. <laughs> I, I just, uh, one is I just wanted to thank you for your talk that you gave tonight. And just, um, the whole talking about the Trinity that I don't see a lot, maybe others are see different, but within the Protestant church and the church in general, I don't hear that discussion hmm. where we speak of God as Trinity or yep. the theology of that. Yep. And the question I have just related to that as I was listening, you talked about that relationship with others, yep. that we don't see others as objects and, and we, how that defining relationship we have with other people and how important that is, is how we see other people. Yep. 
my thought was is in our relationship with God. Yep. It, it seems to me that yep. a lot of what is taught and encouraged is that similar relationship with yep. God. I think that's a great point, yes. As one that saves us, yep. forgives our sins, yep. makes us feel good, yep. makes us not feel bad about that, and does, you know, and it's that same kind of relationship. Yep. Transactional and, kind of, yeah, reality. Transactional. Yep. And I was wondering if you could just say something. Well, I mean, I think that's exactly right. And so I've said that transformational kind of aspect of the Christian life has to be brought into, and also the union with Christ, that you're united with the living God through Christ. That means you actually deepen that relationship. You recognize that it's not about just giving a, you know, God paying you. you we kind of approach God as if some kind of God that we must please in order to get what we want. Many of us approach religion that way. We kind of look at it as, I, I want to get what I want in life. If God's going to help, I'm going to choose God. If I hear amen in the house? Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's important to own that up and say, you know, okay, I've blown it, that's where I am, but I want to be better. So may the Spirit of God really teach me some new things about what it means to take this thing as not a transaction, but as a real relational transformation. And on that note, I think we must close our evening. Thank you very much once again. Yes, thank you very much. This has been wonderful, and we look, very, uh, we look forward very much to hearing you speak tomorrow, and we hope that you will join us tomorrow morning, uh, 8.30 registration, 9 a.m. for the first lecture, and also tomorrow evening for the concert, 7.30 p.m. in Sage Chapel. Thank you all very much for coming out this evening.